Welcome to today's recorded session on hazard communication. My name is Julie Martin and I'll be your presenter for this presentation. First up, let's look at the objectives. So after this course, you should be able to recognize and understand the purpose and scope of hazard communication in your workplace, the role that management and employees can play in complying with the standard, the general requirements regarding chemical hazard classifications, as well as the requirements for an effective written hazard communication program. The purpose of the hazard communication standard is to ensure that companies that actually produce chemicals classify those chemicals that they make or they ship out, and that this information is effectively communicated to both employers and employees. In any standard, it's important to read the scope and application to determine if that standard even applies to you. Now in hazard communication, it states that all employers are to provide information to their employees about the hazardous chemicals to which they're exposed. Now they have to do this by means of a hazard communication program, labels and other forms of warning, safety data sheets, as well as information and training. Employers who do not produce or import chemicals only need to focus on those parts of the standard pertaining to establishing a workplace program and communicating that information to workers. So when does HAZCOM apply? It applies if you have chemicals present in the workplace and if you have a potential for employee exposure to those chemicals under either normal working conditions or in any foreseeable emergency situations. Now, what is meant by foreseeable emergency? Well, that is any potential occurrence, such as equipment failure, rupture of containers, or failure of control equipment. Essentially, it's anything that could result in an uncontrolled release of a hazardous chemical into your workplace. In work operations where employees only handle chemicals in sealed containers that are not open under normal conditions of use, this section applies to those operations only as follows. Labels must be maintained on incoming containers of hazardous chemicals. Those labels cannot be removed or defaced in any way. Safety data sheets must be received with incoming shipments of the sealed containers of hazardous chemicals and those safety data sheets must be maintained. If for some reason a shipment of these hazardous chemicals is received without a safety data sheet, the employer must obtain a copy. Now safety data sheets must be readily accessible to employees during their work shift when in their work areas. And employers must ensure that employees are provided with information and training as required in the standard to the extent necessary that they can protect themselves in the event of an accidental spill or leak of that hazardous chemical from a sealed container. Now these are just some of the substances that hazard communication doesn't apply to. Now cosmetics, which are packaged for sale to consumers as in a retail establishment, and then cosmetics being used for just personal consumption are not covered by hazard communication. Consumer products, um, even a hazardous substance, where the employer can show that it's merely being used as it would be in the home, normal home consumption, would not be covered by hazard communication. Nuisance particulates, where the chemical manufacturer can establish but that there's no physical or health hazard, is also not covered by this standard. Radiological or biological agents are not covered unless accompanied by an otherwise covered hazardous chemical. For example, if you have a container with a biological sample packed in an organic solvent, then the container would be subject to HASCOM. Seen listed here are the key elements of a hazard communication program. Now we're going to be going over each one of these in detail in the coming slides. In the HASCOM standard, a hazardous chemical is defined as any chemical that is classified as a physical hazard, a health hazard, simple asphyxiant, combustible dust, a pyrophoric gas, or a hazard not otherwise classified. Now don't worry if you don't know what all of these are. We're going to be going over each of these in the next few slides. A physical hazard is a chemical that is classified as posing hazardous physical effects. For example, explosives. 
These substances can undergo a rapid chemical reaction that produces large amounts of gas and heat. This can lead to an explosion, which can lead to fatal injuries to your body or even death. Oxidizing agents. Now these are substances that supply oxygen to a fire. It helps it burn. These materials can make a fire spread and grow, which is very dangerous, especially if you're in enclosed spaces. Flammables. Flammable materials can easily catch on fire and burn. They can be in the form of liquids, gases, aerosols, or solids. Flammables are often found in our daily lives, so it's important to be cautious when handling them. Corrosive materials. Corrosive materials can also damage metal surfaces. This is because it can eat away at materials, causing them to break down. And then gas under pressure. Now these materials contain gases and they're under pressure. So they can explode or burst. They can explode when heated and can lead to serious or fatal injuries to the body. Now some examples you might see are aerosol cans, propane tanks, butane lighters, and oxygen tanks. Now further definitions and descriptions of these categories can be found in the mandatory Appendix B of this standard. Health hazards. These are chemicals that can cause harm to the health of workers. Some examples are respiratory or skin sensitizers. These chemicals can lead to the immune system producing an allergic response to a substance. A respiratory sensitizer, this is a substance that will induce a hypersensitivity of the airways following inhalation of that chemical. Now a skin or a contact sensitizer can produce an allergic reaction following skin contact. Another example is germ cell mutagens. These can cause mutations in your germ cells. This could lead to a loss of fertility, embryonic death, or even harmful mutations that can be passed on to future generations, leading to genetic disorders and even birth defects. Specific target organ toxics, or STOTs, these can cause adverse toxic effects on a specific organ or an organ system, such as your liver or your immune system. One thing to remember is health hazards are not always evident and prolonged exposure to chemicals with known health hazards can cause health problems later on in an employee's life. Now, definitions of these terms are located in mandatory Appendix A. A pyrophoric gas is a gas with an auto ignition temperature in air at or below 130 degrees Fahrenheit or 54.4 degrees Celsius. Now examples of pyrophoric gas are arsine, silane, disilane, dichlorosilane, and diborane. Now specifically arsine, as we're shown here, is pyrophoric as well as highly toxic. It's one of the simplest compounds of arsenic. It's used in the synthesis of semiconducting materials relating to microelectronics and solid state lasers. A simple asphyxiant is a substance or mixture that displaces oxygen in the ambient atmosphere. In simple terms, it pushes the oxygen away. This means that the oxygen is not available, causing people to essentially suffocate if they are not removed from that hazard. Now, exposure to simple asphyxiants can lead to unconsciousness and death. Simple asphyxiants are of a particular concern if you're in an enclosed space. Some examples of these include gases such as nitrogen, helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. OSHA created the Hazard Not Otherwise Classified, or HNOC, definition to cover health or physical hazard substances that are intrinsically dangerous during normal use or foreseeable emergencies, but do not meet the cutoff values or concentration limit of the hazard class, or is under a global harmonization system hazard category that has not been adopted by OSHA. Now, HNOCs are required to appear in Section 2 of its Associated Safety Data Sheet. OSHA's definition for HNOC ensures that hazards covered under the previous HAZCOM standard remain covered under this new current revised standard. An example of an HNOC is a material such as a static accumulator. Static accumulating flammable materials can become electrostatically charged even in bonded and grounded equipment. Sparks can ignite and vapor can cause flash fire or explosion. 
This paragraph in the standard requires that chemical manufacturers and importers identify and evaluate the available scientific evidence on a chemical in order to determine if it is hazardous, as well as to determine the degree of hazard using the criteria for health and physical hazards located in appendices A and B. Hazard classification provides the basis for the hazard information that's provided on labels, safety data sheets, and an employee training. Therefore, it's important that classification be performed accurately and consistently. Each type of hazard covered is considered a hazard class, such as acute toxicity or carcinogenicity. And most of these hazard classes are also subdivided into hazard categories to reflect the degree of severity of the effect. For instance, category one or category three. The general concept of classification is to determine the hazardous effect, such as a carcinogen, and the severity of the effect, such as category one or category two. A written hazard communication program is a requirement of the standard, and a copy of it must be made available upon request to both employees and the representatives, such as a spouse or a lawyer, as well as OSHA representatives, such as compliance officers. Failure to do so is a violation and will typically result in citations and penalties. The HASCOM written program must contain at a minimum the label systems and other forms of warning that are in use in the facility or workplace, safety data sheets or SDSs for each hazardous chemical, information and training for workers on the hazards of the chemicals in their workplace and how to protect themselves, and a list of the hazardous chemicals known to be present in the workplace. Now this list may be compiled for the workplace as a whole or for individual work areas. The written plan must also include the methods the employer will use to inform employees of the hazards of non-routine tasks, for example, the cleaning of a reactor vessel, and the hazards associated with any chemicals contained in unlabeled pipes that are present in their work areas. Employers who produce, use, or store hazardous chemicals at a workplace in such a way that the employees of other employers may be exposed must ensure that the hazard communication programs developed and implemented deal with how those employers can protect their employees. This includes the methods the employer will use to provide the other employers on-site access to safety data sheets for each hazardous chemical the other employer's employees can be exposed to while working. The methods the employer will use to inform the other employers of any precautionary measures that they need to take to protect themselves while working during the normal operating conditions and in foreseeable emergencies as well as the methods the employer will use to inform the other employers of the labeling system used in the workplace. Where employees must travel between workplaces during a work shift, such as their work is being carried out at more than one geographical location, the written hazard communication program can be kept at a primary workplace facility. Labeling is a requirement of the HAZCOM standard, and hazardous chemicals must be labeled. These labels must contain the required minimum information, and they must be affixed to or otherwise attached or printed on the hazardous chemical container. These labels must also be in English and prominently displayed so that employees can see them. As I said previously, the employer must ensure that labels or other forms of warning are legible in English and prominently displayed on the container. Employers who have employees who speak other languages may add the information in that language to the material presented, as long as the information is presented in English as well. Now the label must contain the information listed here on this slide. The product identifier, this means the name or the number used for the hazardous chemical, its, its identifying name. Um, this is what's going to show up on its label or on its safety data sheet. It provides a unique means by which the user can identify the chemical. Signal word. This means a word that's used to indicate the relative level of severity of hazard, and it alerts the reader to the potential hazard on the label. The signal words used in the standard are danger, and warning. Hazard statement. 
It's a statement assigned to a hazard class and category that describes the nature of the hazards of a chemical, including, where appropriate, the degree of the hazard. Pictogram. It's a composition that can include a symbol plus other graphic elements such as a border, background, pattern, or color. It is intended to convey specific information about the hazards of a chemical. There are eight pictograms designated under the standard for application to a hazard category. Precautionary statement. It's a phrase that describes recommended measures that should be taken to minimize or prevent adverse effects resulting from exposure to a hazardous chemical or improper handling or storage. Let's look over these different parts of a label in a little bit more detail. First up, let's look at signal word. A signal word is a word used to indicate the level of severity of hazard. It alerts the reader to the potential hazard that's on the label. Now it's going to typically appear near the top of a warning, sometimes in all capital letters. The signal word is generally understood to serve a dual purpose. It alerts the user to a hazard and indicates a particular level of hazard. The final rule requires the use of one of two signal words for labels. You have danger or warning. Now whether danger or warning is used on a label depends on the hazard classification of the substance in question. Danger is used for more severe hazards. Warning is used for less severe hazards. Of note, if any hazard category has an associated signal word of danger, that is the only signal word that can be used. Next is the hazard statement. Hazard statements describe the hazards associated with a chemical. Labels are required to have specific hazard and precautionary statements. These statements are prescribed based on the hazard classification of the chemical. Hazard statements describe the hazards associated with a chemical. For example, causes serious eye damage or toxic if inhaled. A pictogram is a graphical composition that can include a symbol along with other graphical elements such as a border or a background color. Now a pictogram is a communication tool and it's intended to convey very specific information. Pictograms in labeling have a lot of advantages. They are perceived much more rapidly than words. They are more easily transferred across cultures than languages and they are more easily understood by those who have difficulty reading. Evidence shows that pictograms can serve as useful and effective communication tools. Now, although the United Nations GHS uses nine pictograms, OSHA only enforces eight. They do not enforce the environment pictogram. We're gonna be looking at these nine pictograms in the next slide. As you can see here, this is all nine of the GHS pictograms, but as previously stated, OSHA only enforces eight of these. Now, although the UN's GHS uses these nine pictograms, OSHA does not enforce the environment pictogram since we do not regulate environmental hazards. However, do not ignore it because that is enforced by the EPA. Next, we're gonna look at each one of these individually. This is a pictogram for a corrosive substance. This can eat through metals and destroy living tissue. A corrosive sign warns the individual to prevent breathing of vapors and mist and avoid any contact with eyes, skin, and clothing. This is the one that's probably the most familiar, the good old skull and crossbones. This represents acute toxicity. This pictogram represents health hazards such as carcinogens, mutagens, reproductive toxics, respiratory sensitizers, aspiration toxic, and target organ toxics. To me, it looks like an alien bursting out of somebody's chest, so that's how I remember it. This pictogram is the exclamation mark or warning. This is used for skin and eye irritants, skin sensitizers, harmful acute toxics, narcotic effects, and respiratory tract irritants. This is the fire hazards pictogram. You'll see this on flammable chemicals, pyrophorics, self-heating chemicals, things that emit flammable gas, self-reactives, and organic peroxides. Here you see the oxidizers pictogram, or the flaming O. Oxidizers initiate or promote combustion in other materials. 
causing fire either of itself or through the release of oxygen or other gases. Now this is a physical hazard. This is a pictogram of a compressed gas cylinder. So you guessed it, it represents gases under pressure. This is the exploding bomb pictogram. It represents explosives, self-reactives, and organic peroxides. Precautionary statements, when you see them on a label or an SDS, describe recommended measures that should be taken to protect against hazardous exposures, improper storage, or improper handling of a chemical. Some examples would be wear face protection, keep away from open flames, etc. We see here an example of a primary label. This is a type of label that would come on a chemical container straight from your manufacturer or from your supplier. Now, as you can see, all the required elements are shown here. At the top, the product identifier, it's camphor. The signal word here is warning. Your hazard statements is telling you the basic hazards. It's a flammable solid, harmful is swallowed, causes skin irritation. You also have your pictograms to the side. The one at the top, flammable. The one at the bottom is your exclamation mark, which means it's probably an irritant or similar. If you look over to the left of your exclamation mark, you've got your precautionary statements. This again is telling you what not to do. Don't do these things in order to stay safe. So this says keep away from heat, sparks, open flames, no smoking, avoid breathing, if it gets in your eyes, rinse cautiously with water. Below that, you also see the name, address, and telephone number of the manufacturer or the supplier. That's important information in case of an emergency release. Now, all of the information that we've gone through previously, that is what's required for workplace labeling. Each hazardous chemical container must be labeled tagged or marked with that information that I just showed you on the primary label or a label that's constructed in-house but still contains all of that necessary information to include your product identifier in words, your pictograms, your, or any combination thereof which provide at least general information regarding the hazards of that chemical. Just to let you know, there is a labeling exemption in the standard. Now, portable containers, which are meant for immediate use only, do not need to be labeled. However, this is a limited exemption that only applies when certain conditions are met. Now, the hazardous chemical must be under the control of and used only by the person who transfers it from a labeled container into the unlabeled container and only within the work shift in which it is transferred. Now what this means essentially is that the employee cannot walk away or leave that container unattended at any time, even only for a short break without either labeling the container or disposing of the contents. One way to think of it is that the employee is working as the label, so if they walk away, the container is no longer labeled. Let's do a quick knowledge check. The maintenance department at your plant found that Lysol toilet bowl cleaner does a great job for polishing the outside of the storage tanks. Your supervisor says that there's no need to train you because the material is a common consumer cleaning product and you'll be using it for its intended use. What do you think? Is this correct? Well, actually, no. <laughs> Employees who are required to work with hazardous chemicals in a manner that results in the duration and frequency of exposure greater than what a normal consumer would experience, they have a right to know about the properties of those hazardous chemicals. Cleaning the outside of a storage tank typically would take much more time than cleaning a toilet bowl. Similarly, if your job is to clean toilets, your frequency of exposure would be much greater than someone cleaning a toilet at home. Safety data sheets, or SDSs, are written or printed material that contains pertinent safety and health information provided by the manufacturer or the distributor. The SDS are a valuable resource to enable you to understand what the dangers are of the chemicals you're working with or are exposed to occupationally. Now, workers have sometimes had difficulty understanding the information presented on safety data sheets. In some cases, the length and complexity of the documents have made it difficult for workers to locate that important safety information. 
I found an example of this happening. It was provided by a hospital safety director. Now, in this situation, a worker was unable to find critical information on a safety data sheet in an emergency situation. Let me read it to you now. Two gallons of the chemical xylene spilled in the lab of my hospital. By the time an employee had noticed the spill, the ventilation had already sucked much of the vapor into the HVAC. This in turn became suspended in the ceiling tile over our radiology department. Twelve employees were sent to the emergency room. To make the matter worse, the lab employee was frantically searching through the binder in her area for the safety data sheet for xylene. Once she found it, she had difficulty locating the spill response section. After notifying the engineering department, she began to clean up the spill with solid waste rags known for spontaneous combustion and placing those rags into a clear plastic bag for disposal. She did not know that xylene had a flash point of 75 degrees Fahrenheit. She then walked the bag down to her incinerator room and left it there, basically creating a live bomb. Twelve people were treated from this exposure. The lab employee was very upset and concerned about the safety of the affected employees and visitors and hysterically kept stating that she could not find the necessary spill response information. Now this example shows the importance of employees knowing where to find the safety data sheet and more importantly knowing how to utilize the information that's inside of it. Now because of that, safety data sheets are required to be provided to the employer by chemical manufacturers and importers. These safety data sheets must be maintained up to date. If the chemical changes its formulation, the manufacturer has to update that safety data sheet. The employer, if you change your supplier, you have to get a new chemical safety data sheet from that new supplier. You must always have a correct and up-to-date version available for your employees. Now on this slide you see the section headings of the safety data sheet. 1 through 12 are the ones that are enforced by OSHA. 12 through 16 are actually enforced by other government agencies. Now the employer is required to maintain in the workplace copies of the required safety data sheets for each hazardous chemical and has to make sure that they are readily accessible to each employee during each work shift. Now electronic access and other alternatives to maintaining paper copies of the safety data sheets are permitted as long as there are no barriers to immediate employee access in each workplace. Now what do you do in the event of a systems failure if you're using an electronic system? You have to have a backup system in place. For instance, if internet access is unavailable due to a large volume of use or perhaps a loss of power, the employer must have another means for receiving the required information quickly. Remember, you have to always ensure that the employees can access those safety data sheets readily and during their work shift. Now where employees have to travel between workplaces during a work shift, such as their work is carried out at more than one geographical location, those safety data sheets can be kept at a primary workplace facility. Now in that situation, the employer must still ensure that employees can immediately obtain the required information in an emergency. If a chemical exposure occurs, employees have a right to access records of the exposure as well as any associated medical records. Now included in this exposure record must be a copy of the safety data sheet for the chemical that was up to date at the time of the employee exposure. Now if for some reason a safety data sheet is not available, a chemical inventory or other type of record must be kept in the exposure record which would reveal the identity of the toxic chemical and where and when it was used. Now these employee exposure records must be held and maintained for a minimum of 30 years. Now whenever an employee or their representative requests access to an employee exposure record, the employer must provide access in a reasonable time, place, and manner. Now if the employer can't provide access to the record within 15 working days, the employer must inform the employee or their representative within that 15-day working period the reason for the delay and the earliest date that the record will be made available. Hazard communication training has to be provided upon initial employment 
and when any new hazards are introduced into the workplace. Now, while the standard does not state that annual refresher or periodic training is required, employers should observe that employees must retain the information learned and that some continual training is expected. It is the employer's responsibility to ensure that employees are adequately trained and equipped with the necessary knowledge. Now, training can be conducted on each specific chemical or by categories, such as carcinogens, sensitizers, toxic agents, that may or are being encountered by an employee during the course of their duties. Now, chemical-specific information must always be available through labels and SDSs. The training provisions of the standard are not satisfied solely by giving employee the data sheets to read. An employee's training program is to be a forum for explaining to employees not only the hazards of the chemicals in their work area, but also how to use the information generated through the HASCOM program. Now, this can be accomplished in many different ways. You could use audiovisuals, you could do classroom instructions, interactive video, hands-on training. But it should all include an opportunity for employees to ask questions and to ensure that they understand the information presented to them. Furthermore, the training must be comprehensible. If the employees receive job instruction in a language other than English, then the training and information to be conveyed under the standard will also need to be conducted in a foreign language. We recommend that all training be documented, even though the standard does not require it. Employees must be provided with the following information. The requirements of the HASCOM standard, the training section. Any operations in the work area where hazardous chemicals are present. The location and availability of the written HASCOM program, including the required lists of hazard chemicals and safety data sheets required by the section. Hazard communication training topics must include at a minimum the methods and observations that may be used to detect the presence or release of a hazardous chemical in the work area. Now these can include such things as the monitoring being conducted by the employer, any continuous monitoring devices in the work area, as well as the visual appearance or odor of a hazardous chemical if it's been released. The training must also include the physical, health, simple asphyxiation, combustible dust, and pyrophoric gas hazards of any chemicals in the work area, as well as any chemical hazards not otherwise classified. The training must also include measures that employees can take to protect themselves from these hazards. This has to include specific procedures the employer has implemented to protect employees from exposure. This should include appropriate work practices, emergency procedures, and personal protective equipment that is to be used. It must also include details of the hazard communication program that was actually developed by the employer. This must include an explanation of the labels received on shipping containers, any workplace labeling systems being used by the employer, the safety data sheets, including the order of information and how employees can obtain and use the appropriate hazard information. What if you have a chemical that's a trade secret and don't want it to show up on a safety data sheet? Well, the chemical manufacturer, importer, or employer may withhold the specific chemical identity, including the chemical name and other specific identification of a hazardous chemical, if it can be proven that that information is being withheld as a part of a trade secret. Now, information contained in the safety data sheet concerning the properties and effects of the hazardous chemical must still be disclosed. And the safety data sheet must indicate that the specific chemical identity is being withheld because it is a trade secret. Now, what happens if an employee is exposed to something under trade secret? Well, where a treating physician or nurse determines that a medical emergency exists and the specific chemical identity of a hazardous chemical is necessary for emergency or first aid treatment, that chemical manufacturer, importer, or employer must immediately disclose the specific chemical identity of a trade secret chemical to the treating physician or nurse, regardless of the existence of a written statement of need or a confidentiality agreement. 
Now, if there's a non-emergency situation, the trade secret information, such as the specific chemical identity or percentage composition, must be disclosed if a health professional requests that information in writing and describes the occupational health need. At the end of the HAZCOM standard, there is a section of appendices, as you can see listed here. Please feel free to look through these. Some of them are mandatory, some non-mandatory, but they can help increase your knowledge of the requirements of the HASCOM standard. And we've reached the end of our presentation. Now, in this course, we looked at the purpose and scope of hazard communication in the workplace, the role management and employees play in complying with the standard, the general requirements regarding chemical hazard classifications, as well as the requirements for an effective written hazard communication program. For more information on hazard communication and other occupational safety topics, please go to our webpage at labor.nc.gov.